Welcome everyone to the My Horse University and Extension Horse Quest live webcast on winter care considerations. The presenter for this evening is Dr. Nettie Leiber. Nettie grew up on eastern Long Island, New York and has been a li lifelong horse person. She spent 11 years as a 4-H member of the East End Equestrians and consequently is a strong advocate of horsemanship, proper horse care, and animal welfare. She received her Master of Science degree in Animal Science from Rutgers University in 2005 and earned her PhD in January of 2011 in Equine Exercise Physiology and Nutrition. Her research area focused on the effects of age and exercise training on endocrine control and the cortisol response to insulin resistance. Nettie worked as a technical equine nutritionist for the Kent Nutrition Group for three and a half years and is now an independent consultant on equine nutrition, exercise physiology, and equine product development. She also serves on the board of directors for the East End Livestock and Horsemen's Association. Dr. Leiber still resides on Long Island with her husband, Randy, and has one horse, a registered appendix gelding named Please Be Quiet, or otherwise known as ET, who she actively rides and competes with in the equitation and hunter divisions. And I'd also like to let everyone know that you're able to ask questions during the presentation via the text chat on the left side of your screen. And the presentation today will be recorded and uploaded to our website if you want to review the talk at a later date. And at this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dr. Leibert. Thank you, Gwen, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And I encourage your participation and I look forward to your questions as we go through this evening. So just a brief outline of what we're gonna cover tonight. Uh, in brief, what makes winter so special? Why do we even worry about special considerations? We'll talk a little bit about forage and when you might need to supplement your horse's diet. Of course, the importance of water, which we all know, but it always hurts to, it never hurts to review. We'll talk a little bit about exercise and turnout and some of the changes that sometimes happen when the temperatures drop, as well as the issues of blanketing and clipping. And then we'll wrap it all up with a brief summary and then continue on to take your questions. So to begin with, why is winter so special? Well, there are lots of reasons. For many of us, especially in the Mid-Atlantic, in the Northeast, in the Upper Midwest, any available pasture that you might have usually goes dormant and the availability just diminishes. Um, if you're like me and you prefer nice warm temperatures to freezing cold ones, you may not be spending as much time outside and perhaps your training or your work sessions with your horse are of shorter duration. Turnout may be limited if you have three feet of snow on the ground, it's hard to put your horse outside. Um, but again, if you have another day where it's not, you don't have so much snow, then maybe you can continue your normal routine. Uh, the issue of water buckets freezing in the colder temperatures can be a big problem because water is, of course, essential. If you have older horses, they actually, much like people, as horses and people age in a very similar way. So as they get older, they may have a harder time keeping warm. So there are lots of things you can do to help them out a little bit. And then again, nutritional needs may change, be it due to less pasture or you know, changes in workload. So all of these things factor in. Body size also matters. If you, uh, in this picture on the right here, you see obviously those two horses are quite different. One is a draft breed, the other is a mini. And when you have these large draft breeds, there's actually less body surface area exposed to the air per unit of weight compared to a smaller horse or even a lighter breed, such as a thoroughbred or an Arabian. And the larger horses, such you know, the larger draft breeds actually handle the cold a little bit better. Newborn foals, especially, uh, I saw we had somebody from, Ken from Kentucky in the audience. Um, a lot of the thoroughbreds are born early in the year in effort to make sure they have as much time to mature before they're considered yearlings and two-year-olds as possible. Um, whereas in Kentucky, it may not be as cold as it gets in, say, Maine or northern Michigan, but those newborn foals are less tolerant of cold than their mature counterparts. Mares who are in late pregnancy have huge energy needs to begin with. But, you know, if they're well cared for, if they're in good body condition, they're generally okay in the colder months. And of course, if you notice them losing weight, that's, that's of course an issue. But 
a lot of times hay can just fix that. So one of the things I wanted to start out with, um, dentition of your horse, the condition of his teeth, not specifically a winter problem, but I did want to point out, in case you've never seen them, what some of the hooks look like. And you can see that green arrow. Uh, I found this image, and it shows a hook in the front of the molar. And on uh, towards the back of the mouth, the area of where an ulcer has formed on the horse's gum. If you've ever felt one of these, they're pretty sharp. They feel almost as sharp as the end of a nail head. So if you can imagine having that in your mouth and then trying to chew hay, you can imagine that it's probably fairly painful. So uh, again, I believe we have a poll question um, that I wanted to ask the audience. Uh, how often do you have your horse's teeth checked? And I believe you can, you can just select your answer and the results will be immediately shown to you. Do you have them looked at once a year, twice a year, rarely, or maybe never? <laughs> Hopefully not never. All right, and it looks like most of you have your horse checked at least once a year, if not twice. So that's really that's really good. Uh, it's recommended by most veterinarians and the AAEP, of course, to have your horse's teeth checked at least once a year, uh, especially as they get older, uh, because you want to make sure that they're able to chew properly. So I thank you for your participation. I'll have one or two more questions coming up. Um, and then uh, aside from proper tooth care, I just wanted to mention parasite control. I'm not going to go into methods of parasite control tonight, um, but do note that if your horse has an out-of-control parasite load, uh, you know, he's a high shedder or has lots of problems with that, it can have a negative impact on gut health, the ability to absorb nutrients and maintain weight. So, uh, and you, you know, as the horse goes through the year, of course, control program is important. Let me get rid of my green arrow there. All right, so the table that you see in front of you, this is actually based on studies of cattle. Uh, there has been some research in horses, but not to the extent that there have been in other breeds. Uh, but one of the major effects of cold on horses is an increase in energy needs, and that's animals in general, not just horses. Um, so the chart is just showing an example of when the wind picks up, how much energy can increase. One of the best ways to help increase the amount of energy your horse takes in and to help him keep warm is to feed hay or forage. Um, it's very high in fiber and the microbes in the hindgut will ferment and digest that fiber and one of the byproducts of fermentation is heat and that, uh, and that heat helps, to keep, helps the horse to maintain his body temperature, especially in the cold cold weather. So it is increase of forage is preferable to increases in grain when you're trying to achieve uh, an increased amount of heat because, uh, the, again, the, the microbes in the hindgut will ferment on the fiber, whereas many grain products are higher in starch and that won't do much for your horse's body temperature. So if anybody has a little guy like this in their barn, <laughs> a horse who likes to chew or get his face into everything, we've all met one. Uh, one of the benefits of forage, of course, is that it satisfies your horse's need to chew. That's sort of a, a fringe benefit of forage, but hopefully it keeps him out of trouble. Um, and the source of, sources of fiber, uh, again, are hay, hay cubes, beet pulp. We'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. But digestible fiber, again, provides energy for those microorganisms. It also provides some energy for the horse, some B vitamins, and then again in winter, heat, as we just talked about. Some of the indigestible fiber, which is a naturally occurring portion of hay and forage, helps to slow the intake of some of your easily digested carbohydrates. In other words, some of the things that are more rapidly digested in your grain concentrates or commercially uh, available feed products that you may be feeding to your horse. Indigestible fiber is low in grain products. Uh, so that's why the balance of hay and grain can help keep everything fairly even keel. I always find it helpful to just review what good quality forage looks like. If any of you have ever seen poor quality hay, if you've opened up a bale and it smells very musty, obviously that's not something we want to feed to the horses. Good hay is fairly low in moisture. Um, it's green, it smells good, uh, hopefully it's been cut before maturity so you're not seeing a lot of seed heads in grass hay or a lot of 
bloom or flowers in legume hay, such as alfalfa. And of course, you want it to be free from weeds or any foreign objects, animal carcasses, things like that. It does happen, and hopefully that's not, you're not going to find that in your hay. So, all right, we've got some good quality hay, um, but say you have a horse whose teeth may be compromised. Maybe he can't chew hay that well. There are, these are some examples of some forage alternatives that you can use to either supplement or replace part of your hay supply with. Uh, the first one is hay cubes. Um, and again, some people are hesitant of hay cubes, but you really don't need to be. It's very easy to soak them. They will absorb a lot of water. And that can be very beneficial to helping to increase the amount of water your horse takes in on a cold day. You can use warm water, you can use tap water, uh, but again, Hay cubes usually come with a minimum guaranteed analysis of protein being the most important one, fat and fiber, of course. Uh, so at least if your hay quality is inconsistent, if you supplement with some hay cubes, you know you're getting at least a certain amount of protein. And they come in grass, uh, such as Timothy or Legume alfalfa varieties or a mix of the two. Uh, bee pulp is another favorite of mine. There's a picture of it uh, over here on the bottom right-hand side, some bee pulp shreds there. Bee pulp is a very highly digestible fiber. So the horse himself actually doesn't do too much with bee pulp. Again, this is basically feeding the microorganisms in the hindgut, and it feeds the good microorganisms in the hindgut. And when they flourish and they do well, not only can it ward off some of the bad or the harmful bacteria, but again, it'll provide the horse with some energy and some extra heat in the winter. Also, highly recommended to soak beet pulp, another way to help get some extra water into the system. Uh, not pictured here are hay pellets, but there are a variety of brands available um, in the forms of uh, large pellets, essentially. And they don't provide a lot of long stem fiber. They usually can supplement a portion of your hay or your forage supply, but usually can't replace all of it. Um, horses usually love them. Again, horses with bad teeth, you can water it down and make a mush, and they can slurp it up pretty readily. So again, those are some ways to supplement the diet, but sometimes forage is not enough to help your horse maintain weight. Uh, whether you have a hard keeper, of course, many thoroughbreds are notorious for that, but it's not exclusive to, the, to thoroughbreds. Um, horses that are training throughout the winter, again, usually need some kind of supplemental calories. Um, again, if your hay quality is not the greatest or inconsistent, or maybe you have to soak it if you have a carbohydrate-sensitive horse, you may be losing some of the nutrients in that hay. So this is when things like grain concentrates and ration balancers can come into play. Grain concentrates can add calories and add protein. There are a myriad of products on the market, many different brands, different protein levels, different fat levels, low starch varieties. So there's pretty much something out there for everybody. Ration balancers are basically, you can think of ration balancers like taking your daily vitamin because that's all they are. They're usually fed in very small amounts and they provide all of the vitamins and minerals your horse needs in a concentrated form without providing a lot of extra calories. So again, if your hay's not that great, you're not sure what's in it, you can feed a ration balancer without worrying about making your horse overweight or hyper or hot or any of those things. And it's actually very good for overweight horses and helping them to get weight off. For your hard keepers, fat supplements can add a lot of calories without adding sugar. Fat has a little more than twice the calories uh, for an equal amount of sugar. So you get a lot of bang for your buck. And it takes a long time to metabolize. So the release of energy is very slow. So it really does not encourage hyperactivity. That's why you'll see things like cool calories and things of that nature. Um, some examples of fat supplement include rice bran oil as well as vegetable oil. And there are many varieties of vegetable oil, for example, uh, canola oil or corn oil. You'll see any of these in your supermarket, much less your local tax store. So we got some good forage, uh, we've got some supplement, maybe some grain, and of course we'll just talk a little bit about the importance of water. You don't need me to tell you that it's necessary for life, for you, for me, for our horses, and it is essential for normal digestive processes. Now the more forage you feed your horse, the more water he needs to keep everything moving through the gut and to keep everything lubricated. 
So it's very important, especially in wintertime, to make sure your horse is drinking enough water. It helps to prevent colic. Now your average adult horse, who weighs about 1,000 pounds, needs roughly 10 gallons of water per day. Now of course in the summertime, when it's hot and humid, that need is going to increase. In the wintertime it might decrease a little bit, but it's not really going to go below 10 gallons a day. Um, if you're turning your horse out in a group, it is important to have enough water available for each horse. Uh, I have seen horses guarding water sources and preventing others from getting to them, in which case multiple sources might be necessary. Um, and some people think, well, maybe snow is okay. If you can't get to the water trough, you can eat some snow. It's actually not an acceptable substitute because the horse would need to eat such a tremendous amount of snow to meet his water needs. It's really not realistic. Um, so again, it's okay if he eats snow, but it's probably not going to provide all the water he needs. So horses do tend to drink less in winter. Of course, that's a generalization. Uh, they do sweat less, oftentimes exercising less in some cases. There have been some studies on what temperature horses like to drink. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't like to drink water at 33 degrees. It would be a little bit chilly. Um, and it seems that water between 45 and 65 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 7 to 18 degrees Celsius, is preferable for most horses. And warming it above freezing may especially encourage older horses to drink. Uh, their teeth get sensitive just like we do, especially if they're worn down very low. And again, it is just important to keep those water sources accessible. Uh, for those of us in the colder states, sometimes you need to employ a bucket heater. And there are a lot of different types of bucket heaters. There are ones geared for the smaller five gallon buckets. If your horse is in a stall at night, there are ones that you can put in your 200 gallon water trough to keep that from freezing. Uh, if that's not an, you do want to make sure they are UL listed and you do want to check them every now and then. So put your hand in the bucket with the water heater and make sure it's not emitting any electric shock. That would, of course, discourage your horse from drinking. So you do want to keep an eye on them. If your water sources are freezing, it goes without saying that you need to break that ice up at least once, probably twice a day, depending on the temperature. And it is harder to keep the water sources clean in the wintertime, especially with freezing temperatures. But you want to make sure that there's no manure in there. And of course, that uh, maybe some uh, errant animal has gotten in there and unfortunately gotten stuck. That is, of course, a deterrent as well. And if you can, it's sometimes difficult to monitor your horse's intake, especially if they're living outside and drinking from a common source. But hopefully you can try to keep an eye on it and make sure everybody's drinking a little bit each day. So there are some ways to encourage your horses to drink, especially when uh, they're eating more forage. Of course, having a water source that is accessible is number one. Electrolytes can be used to encourage thirst, but judiciously. I usually don't recommend them every day. And I've heard uh, some people even like to flavor the water. And this works for traveling as well. If you're going to a horse show or an endurance ride, sometimes the horses don't like the taste of different water. So many of them like peppermint, for example. You can put a drop of peppermint oil to mask any differences in water intake. And then, of course, having a salt or a mineral block readily available at all times is a good thing. Horses do have a taste for salt, and they will seek it out. So salt will encourage thirst. Uh, so again, having that available in general is a good thing. Uh, I think I have another question at this point. Um, have you ever tried to encourage your horse to drink more in the winter? Or, and how have you done that? Um, have you warmed the water, provided salt, flavoring the water? You haven't tried anything? Uh, or you have another suggestion? Or maybe you've done multiple. <laughs> multiple versions of this. All right, it looks like most of you are kind-hearted souls and have warmed up the water. Of course, most of us provide salt, so that's good. Right, well, again, I thank you for your participation. I always like to see how everybody's doing, everybody else is doing things, so. All right, so we talked a little bit about diet. We'll talk a little bit next about exercise and turnout. 
Um, again, sometimes in the winter, a turnout can be a challenge if the ground is frozen or if you have a lot of snow. Um, exercise intensity, again, often decreases. Now, footing is still an important safety consideration, whether or not you're riding your horse. Sometimes, uh, especially uh, where I live here on Long Island in the wintertime, if we get a mushy snowfall that consequently freezes, you actually can't turn the horses out because it's so slippery, you get really worried that they're going to lose their footing, and that's not exclusive to here. Exercise, horses can handle the cold very well. They're very adaptable, but uh, they are actually the only other mammals that sweat to thermoregulate, just like we do. But sweating in the cold can put the horse at risk for a chill. So if you are riding or working or doing any kind of exercise with your horse in the winter, have a cooler ready. They're usually made of fleece or of wool, and they'll help to draw any moisture away from the skin and keep the horse nice and warm as his coat dries. And it does take a while for it to dry in the winter. As any of you who have ever ridden your horse to a sweat in a cold January and then had to walk him out for two hours knows, uh, of course, you certainly don't, you don't want him to get a chill. But the coolers and keeping him warm will help avoid muscle cramps and chills. And you want to make sure his coat is dry before you put a blanket on him if you are using a blanket. Keeping that wet, sweaty coat underneath a blanket will actually increase your horse's risk of hypothermia in some cases. So you want to make sure his coat is nice and dry before you put his blanket on at night. Turnout, of course, in winter is important, and I recognize that different areas of the country handle winter turnout a little differently, depending on your geography and what your temperatures are. Um, but there are, there have been times here where horses have not been able to go out for a few days because of the weather and the icy conditions. But turnout is still important because horses are designed to move around. We all know this. Horses have no muscles in their legs below their knees and their hocks. So a lot of the circulation there is really facilitated by exercise and by motion. So if you have a horse who tends to stock up, if he's standing in a stall too long, again, as soon as he gets moving, usually that goes right away. Uh, mental health, again, if you or I were cooped up in a room three days straight without getting to go outside, you'd probably go a little nutty too. So uh, fresh air always important, especially in winter if we tend to close up the barns a little too tightly or if ventilation isn't that good in your barn, letting them out and running around and getting fresh air is a good thing. <clears throat> Horses, again, they're very adaptable, just uh, need a little time to adjust. So when the question of riding in the snow comes up, do you do it or do you not do it? And the answer a lot of times is it just depends. Um, if you have a snowfall that's sort of light and fluffy, and not really dense, and it's not that deep, at less than about a foot. There's no ice at the bottom. If you're familiar with the footing and what's underneath that snow, you know, you know where all the ditches and the divots are, sure, go ahead. You probably It's probably okay to, to ride in the snow then. When you don't want to ride in the snow is if that snow is very heavy and very wet, if it does have an icy layer under the top snow layer, or if you're riding in snow in an area that you're not familiar with. Um, if it's a trail you've been down a hundred times or a riding ring that you're very familiar with, um, you know, that's usually okay. But if you're not familiar with where a ditch might be, uh, then you might want to think twice about riding too much in that area. So again, you just want to know where you're riding, avoid the holes and pits that you know exist, and take it easy. You don't need to work your horse like he's on an endurance ride if uh, you're not too sure of the surface or if it's uneven. So, of course, in the topic of winter, the question of blanketing always comes up as well. Do you blanket? Do you not blanket? Uh, these guys in these photos here, uh, the pony on the right is obviously quite fuzzy and has a nice solid coat to get him through the winter. So he looks nice and warm. And the two geldings on the left-hand side are wearing their blankets for the winter. So they're not as fuzzy, and they do have some supplemental warmth there. One of the things I always tell people is if you decide to blanket your horse, do it all season long. Either do it or don't do it. Continuous blanketing tends to flatten the coat a little bit, which makes it less able to insulate the horse. It doesn't mean it won't keep him warm, but it won't do as good a job as if he was left to his own devices. So once you start to blanket, keep doing it all season long. And if you don't blanket, 
and you think, well, gee, it's going to be extra cold. If you throw the blanket on for a few days, that's fine. But generally, the key is to do it or don't do it. If you decide to go ahead and blanket, of course, measuring your horse and determining size is very important. Uh, proper fit, imagine walking around with shoes that don't fit, jeans that are too small or too big. It's not really very comfortable. So if you have a blanket that's causing rubs on your horse's shoulder, it probably doesn't fit him well. And I have been through this with my own horse, going crazy trying to find one that fits just right. But of course you want to find one that stays in place, that won't let hooves get caught if your horse rolls. So it's fairly easy to measure your horse for a blanket in this graphic down here. You can start at the center of the chest and it's uh, if you have a long measuring tape that a seamstress might use that's maybe a hundred inches long, that usually gives you plenty of room. So you start at the center of the chest and then you measure around to about uh, the point of the rump to the center of the tail and you'll get a number and that's usually how most blanket sizes run. Uh, you may measure 75, 76, 78, something like that. Um, Obviously, a quarter horse that measures 78 inches might be a little different from a thoroughbred that measures 78 inches because their shoulder, or their, uh, their shoulders might be of different widths. So there are a variety of blankets you can choose. Many uh, tack shops or customer service uh, workers are very good at helping you determine where, you know, what kind of blanket you might need to accommodate these different body shapes. Of course, different temperatures might require different weights of blankets. So you wouldn't take your light spring jacket and wear it out in a snowstorm in January. You'd probably be a little chilly. Now, what I've written at the bottom of the slide here, this is just an example. It is certainly not a hard and fast rule, but just an example if you have a horse who is either has a thin coat or maybe clipped a little bit, you could probably put a light sheet on them when the temperatures are in the 50, 50 degree range, then that's Fahrenheit. Um, a light blanket usually is about, says it has about 100 grams of fill in the high 30s to low to mid 40s Fahrenheit. A medium blanket's about 200 grams of fill as you get closer to the freezing mark. Um, and then heavier blankets when temperatures drop into the teens or the 20s Fahrenheit or, of course, below negative 6 degrees Celsius. Again, just a guideline, and it is going to depend on your individual horse. So some quick do's and don'ts for blanketing. Do measure your horse. Make sure you take those blankets off maybe once a week at least to check your horse's condition. Make sure his coat's in good shape and that it's not rubbing him anywhere. Change the blanket weight with the temperature, so you wouldn't want to leave a heavy blanket on a horse when it's 50 degrees out. He'll probably be too hot. Um, and then use your coolers after exercise and to help your horse dry out his coat. You don't want to use an ill-fitting blanket. You don't want to cause any rubs or sores there. Again, you don't want to blanket a wet horse. Wait till his coat is dry. Don't blanket him and forget him. You don't want to leave him unchecked all winter. Uh, especially in case he starts to lose weight very quickly or gain weight. You want to touch him and make sure his body condition is fairly consistent. And then, of course, you don't want to leave a wet or a sweaty horse without a cooler. And again, keep that cooler on him till he's nice and dry. And with all the talk about exercise and blanketing and sweating, uh, many people clip their horse's coat in the winter. Some do, some don't. Um, why would you even do this? Of course, if you have an athletic horse, you're training all winter, you want to prevent that coat from getting all wet and sweaty, or if you're very lucky, you get to travel to Florida or perhaps out to California and do the winter circuits in the nice warm weather, uh, again, your horse is not going to need a heavy winter coat. So I found a few examples of clipping styles here, and the areas that are in red are where the hair is left on the horse. Um, top left here is a full body clip, pretty self-explanatory, where you basically take all of the coat off. Top right is a hunter clip where the area or the hair under the saddle is left and the hair on the legs are left for some winter protection as well. Very common is a trace clip where basically the hair is removed under the chin, uh, along the neck, the, under the belly, and just uh, under, just in the lower part of the flank there. These are areas where the horse sweats a lot. And again, with that coat removed, it's very easy to cool them out. There's also a blanket clip where the hair is left basically underneath where a blanket goes, except for the shoulder. Uh, and again, so it provides the horse some insulation without uh, taking away his complete coat. And I think we have our last question here. 
do any of you clip your horse in the winter? And if not, you can say you don't. Uh, what kind of clip? Do you trace body? Does it depend? Or maybe you have another style. This is not an exhaustive list of styles here. It's just an example of some common ones. All right, so it looks like most of you do not clip, and that's certainly more than okay. And it also saves you from getting horse hair all in your clothes <laughs> when you actually do body clip, so. All right, well, although most of you don't clip, um, for anyone who may be tuning in at a later date, if you decide to do it on your own, it's very easy to just clip against the grain of the hair. But clippers are noisy, they tickle, and if you have a horse who's not used to clipping, you know, it's just common sense. As if anything that you're introducing new to your horse, you just want to give them a chance to get used to it, get used to the sound, get used to what it feels like, and of course, enlist help if needed. Um, if your horse does get clipped or you do decide to clip, they will require blankets in the cold weather, of course. It sort of goes without saying. So just to summarize everything this evening, again, horses can adapt to cold very easily. Increased forage will help maintain warmth. And of course, if that's not enough to help your horse maintain weight, then you can add in grain concentrates and fat supplements to help with that aspect of it. Exercise and turnout will help to main fit, maintain fitness, even if it's at a reduced level than what you normally do during warmer months. Uh, proper blanketing can help conserve energy, can help your older horses stay warm without burning too much of their own energy. And clipping can reduce the risk of a chill from excess sweating when done properly. And you keep your coolers and your blankets handy to help that horse stay nice and warm. So I hope that you have gotten some new insight or have learned something new tonight. I certainly thank you for your participation and for attending tonight. And if there are any questions, please feel free to ask away. Okay, I see a question. What about winter grooming? That's a good question. Uh, and again, you can groom your horse just as normally as you do any other time of the year, but keeping in mind that the coat is usually longer. Um, I didn't really talk too much about uh, hoof care, but horses who have shoes tend to accumulate ice balls in their feet a little easier <laughs> than horses who don't have shoes. So that again is an individual kind of thing. Some horses are fine without shoes, some horses their feet fall apart. So it just depends. Um, but of course, a regular curry comb and brushing of the coat is always a good thing um, to help keep uh, the skin stimulated and to, and to make sure you're actually touching your horse and making sure he's not losing too much weight. Uh, Jim, I hope that that answers your question. If not, please feel free to type in a follow-up. Uh, I see a question from Christopher. Is there anything you'd recommend watching out for when using spring water versus city water? Uh, this is an interesting question. Um, sometimes city water can be high in iron depending on, and depending on uh, well, where you are. Very high concentrations of iron can block the absorption of other minerals such as zinc and copper which can affect skin hooves things like that so the only way you really know if that's an issue is if you have your water tested now a lot of towns and municipalities do provide an annual water test like they they either test it and send um send people who who are getting water the results of the survey uh, my own town does this. I have town water at my house here. But let me tell you, they take two samples and they analyze that. As a scientist, that's not really acceptable to me. Uh, but at least it gives you a guideline. So uh, that would be one of the only questions I have is the mineral content. And if that, that may not be an issue where you live. Uh, Melissa is asking, what is the best way to add weight to a horse during the winter? safely. She's concerned that her new appendix gelding, who has dropped some weight going into the winter months. Texas, okay. Texas winter is relatively mild. That is true. Um, 
and you're worried about dumping too much protein in front of him. He's pastured on mostly rocks and cactus and has access to coastal hay all day and night. This is a great question, Melissa. Um, I too, the horse in this picture here is my horse. He's an appendix and he will drop weight just because he feels like it. So I do sympathize with your, with your situation. Um, coastal Bermuda grass hay is very common in your area, of course, in the southeast and in the Texas area. And if it's of good quality, if it is cut right before it gets too mature, it can actually provide some really good nutrition. If it's cut just a hair too late, you lose a lot of nutritional value. Um, protein is not the way to add weight to a horse. The way you want to do that is by increasing forage or by adding a, one of the great ways to do it lately is to add a fat supplement. Um, and you can do that by buying a commercial grain product that has a high fat content. And by high fat content, um, it, it can be 12%. That's usually about as high as you'll get in a grain concentrate. There are fat supplements that go anywhere from 30% up to 99%. And they'll all have different feeding recommendations based on the nature of the product. I'm, I'm sorry, that's a very generic answer. But adding fat to a horse's diet is one of my favorite ways to get them to help gain weight. Um, hay cubes are another way. Adding beet pulp to the diet may also help. Um, so I, again, I do hope that that at least gives you some guidelines. If not, again, feel free to please type a follow-up. Uh, the next question from Lori, how much would you supplement a 1,200 pound thoroughbred in the winter? He needs to gain about 100 pounds before the winter has started. Okay, Lori, well, I'm not sure what part of the country you are in, um, but chances are he's not going to gain 100 pounds by the time it gets really cold. That would be a lot of weight really, really fast, and there's not really a healthy way that you can get them to gain that much weight that quickly. Um, but you can certainly get them started. If you can get them to gain a half to one pound a week, uh, you're actually doing, pre or every you know five to six days, you're actually doing really, really well. So you can tell just by doing the math, it's going to take you a good three, three or four months to get them to gain that weight. And that's okay. Um, it's actually better to do that. Um, so... Assuming that you are feeding plenty of hay, all the hay he can eat, um, again, I would go back to some of the fat supplements, maybe adding in some beet pulp to the diet. I have had tremendous success with beet pulp um, and high fat feeds. Um, and again, when we're finished, I'd be happy to offer you some suggestions off the air as to how to do that. And that really goes for everyone. Um, let's see. I see Melissa, the product you've started on him on is Amplify. Yep, that is a high fat supplement that you can use and it should serve you well. Lori, you're in Vermont. Okay, so with your question about the horse has to gain weight, obviously it's gonna be a little cold in Vermont this winter. So um, yep, forage is a big one and a higher fat. Uh, Mike has a question. What do you think about adding selenium to a 28-year-old horse in Michigan that is underweight? Well, um, not it, Mike. It really depends on the rest of your diet. If the horse, if you, if you are feeding a grain concentrate, and I will use an example of a generic senior horse feed, um, and you're feeding according to how the manufacturer recommends you feed it. For example. They might say, feed a half a pound of this product for every 100 pounds your horse weighs. So if your horse weighs 1,000 pounds, you're feeding five pounds of that product. If you're feeding that five pounds, I wouldn't worry about it because it's for, they're usually fortified and manufactured to provide everything your horse needs. Um, if, <clears throat> excuse me, if he has a documented selenium deficiency, which you can determine via a blood test, um, then Yes, you can do a selenium supplement. Um, I know a lot of our hays in the Northeast and the Upper Midwest are fairly notoriously low in selenium, but um, unless you have reason and or he's showing signs of selenium deficiency, then you may not 
need to, but uh, I can't definitively answer that question without knowing everything the horse is eating. So I hope that's not too, uh, too generic for you. Um, and again, feel free to type a follow-up question. Barry is asking, what rate should corn oil be added to the diet for a 1,200 pound horse? Okay, um, well, it slowly, whenever you're introducing something of that nature to the horse's diet, you wanna do it slowly. Um, so if you're talking about a cup of oil, if you wanna work up to a cup of oil, you're adding a few thousand calories. Um, so if you're going for weight gain, again, certainly that's the way to do it. If you can get your horse to eat that much oil, some of them don't like it. Um, so one recommendation is to obviously spread it out over a few feedings, put it on some hay cubes, which will absorb it very well and sort of disguise the oiliness of it. Um, I would start with maybe a quarter of a cup for four to five days and work up uh, to maybe an additional quarter of a cup for four or five more days, and that's a minimum, uh, until you get up to maybe about a cup of oil. I don't like to recommend feeding more than that. There are other ways to do it. Uh, corn oil is fairly economical, um, but again, you can. there are other fat supplements that you can try as well. But I would start very slowly, again, with about a quarter cup for at least four to five days before you increase it. Chris, yes, thank you. That is a very good point um, about adding a salt block with added selenium for horses. And they are very cost effective, which is of course good. These are all great questions. Thank you all so much for, for, for asking. And I see we have a few more people typing in questions. I think we have a few more questions about to pop up. Jim has asked, uh, you're interested in beet pulp. Do most feed stores carry it or better yet, is it something you can produce yourself? Probably not. Uh, beet pulp is a byproduct of the sugar beet industry. And basically, it's literally just the pulp left over. It is virtually devoid of sugar despite the fact that it comes from the sugar beet. Um, and yes, most feed stores do carry it. It comes in a couple of forms. You can get it in a large pellet, you can get it in shreds, and you can get it in shreds with molasses. Um, even the beet pulp shreds with molasses still have a fairly low sugar content. The difference is surprisingly little between beet pulp shreds with molasses and beet pulp shreds without molasses. Um, you do want to soak it. Uh, the beet pulp pellets need several hours to soak, um, and they will they will increase in volume exponentially. And again, if you're introducing it into your horse's diet, of course you want to start very slowly. Um, even a quarter to a half a cup of pellets will increase in size when added when uh, soaked in water quite considerably. Um, the shreds, on the other hand, yes, you do soak it. Um, the shreds don't increase in size as much as the pellets, but if you, say, take a quart of beet pulp shreds and you put it in a bucket and you soak it in water and make it a nice little soup, it will absorb a lot of that water, but the volume that you see won't change as much as it will with the pellets. The pellets you absolutely have to soak. I do not ever recommend feeding the pellets without soaking them. The shreds, no matter what everybody says out there, I have taken the shreds into my house in a bucket, filled it with water from my kitchen sink, and watched it. 
and after about 15 or 20 minutes, it's pretty much going to absorb most of what it's going to absorb. So you don't need to soak the shreds for hours on end. That is a myth in my opinion. Um, but the pellets do need a longer time to soak. So I, I like the shreds better just from a management standpoint. Um, and again, in the winter, any, any excuse to get some extra water in your horse is a good thing. Actually, while uh, if anyone else is typing, I'll make another comment on beet pulp. Um, it's again, it's a fiber source. Nutritionally, in terms of vitamins and minerals, really not much to it. There's a good bit of calcium in it, and that's about it. So, as far as adding vitamins and minerals to your horse's diet, beet pulp won't do it. But uh, again, it will, of course, it's a great fiber source very safe to feed. I know some people don't like it and that's okay. I happen to love it. <laughs> I see we have a few more people typing questions, so looking forward to those popping up. Okay, Mike says, what are your thoughts on black oil sunflower seeds? Um, I've gotten this question once or twice, haven't seen it in a while. Um, I know some people like to offer it uh, to add some, some calories to their horse's diet. It's probably not going to hurt them. Um, I have not fed it personally. I don't know many people that do. Um, you just want to make sure that it's coming from a good source and that it's been quality tested so you don't want any um, you want to make sure there's you know no molds or fungus growing on it but of course any reputable feed dealer would have quality stuff um, Judy says how much beet pulp do you recommend for a thousand pound horse he is on a senior feed which is mixed in with the beet pulp and also a rice bran supplement um, okay well, Judy, it depends. Um, if it depends on what your goals are, if you're trying to, if you're adding in some beet pulp just to help keep the hindgut healthy, you know, maybe a quart or so is just fine of the shreds I'm talking about. Um, if you want to try to add a little bit of weight, you can go two to three quarts. You work your way up that way, and those are dry shreds. And then you take those two or three quarts of dry shreds, and then you soak them. Um, and you can either spread that out into two or three feedings or um, because, you know, it's a fiber. So uh, I'm, I'm pretty okay with offering, you know, two quarts at once. Oh, and Chris has posted a good article on beet pulp from the horse. They, the horse is a great source of information for everything you ever wanted to know from nutrition to management to welfare. Um, uh, okay, Judy says, this is a 25-year-old horse who cribs, and yes, it is shreds. Okay, um, I'd be interested to know, Judy, if when your horse has hay or something to nibble on in front of him, does he crib any less? Um, you can overfeed on beet pulp, but you really have to feed a lot of it. That was a question that Judy asked. She said, I didn't know if she could, if I could possibly overfeed on beet pulp. You'd have to feed an awful lot of it. Um, something, you'd have to feed something like 10 or, or 15 quarts of it. And usually most people don't feed nearly that much. Um, and Judy also notes that her horse cribs while eating unless somebody stands right by him. All right, so he just wants a dinner companion, I guess. Um, and actually, the horse.com, if you search there, there have been some articles posted on cribbing 
and they do have some interesting insights as to the behavior, so you might find that interesting as well. Uh, and I believe uh, it's Sue, Sue McConnell at the University of Pennsylvania has done a lot of research on equine behavior. And she has a lot of articles on thehorse.com too. Oh, Barry, thank you very much. My pleasure. This is a lot of fun for me, so I'm glad that you enjoyed it. All right. Well, it uh, looks like we're wrapping up the questions here. And so, once again, uh, just like you're putting in the chat here, we'd like to thank Dr. Leibert for her presentation this evening. And also, I would like to thank all of you because you guys have been a wonderful audience. You've asked some great questions uh, this evening, and, and we really appreciate uh, your participation. I uh, just want to let you know about some upcoming webcasts that we have coming up here. Uh, we have... Um, Dr. Ann Swinker from Penn State University. She's going to be talking next month about uh, riding arena footing and management. And then we've got Dr. Colleen Brady from Purdue University uh, talking about health concerns for the overweight horse. And uh, those dates are all set, and you can register for those webinars um, on our website. I think I had uh, posted uh, the URL earlier, but I will put it back in the chat box as well. Right there. And we'd also uh, would really appreciate feedback from you as well. Uh, in the next couple of days, you're going to be getting a survey by us. Um, and if you could just take a few minutes uh, to give us some feedback, it will help us as we um, plan our future webinars and, and programs for you. And finally, we'd just like to make sure to um, if you're interested, please uh, join My Horse University. At, uh, we're on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. And uh, you can always check out our website at myhorseuniversity.com. And also make sure that you check out uh, eExtension uh, Horse Quest as well. And I'm going to put their URL up here in the in the chat box. And eExtension also has many good resources just like MHU and you can find articles and uh, online learning lessons, uh, kind of some self-paced modules and things like that that as well. So check out check us our sites out and um, hopefully we can um, give you some of the educational information that you would need. So once again, thank you everyone, and we hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Gwen.